Welcome, welcome class. Um, do not underestimate the importance of this moment and do not underestimate your importance in um, playing a role in this moment. You only have to look on the news, you only have to switch on the TV and watch the news to realize just how um, important this moment is. Not only are we dealing with this global pandemic, but also like our society is changing as we speak. And the people who are gonna chronicle that change and that shift are you. Uh, we only know about history because of, because someone at some point in time said, okay, what's happening here? What's happening in this city, in this village, in this town, in this moment, in this country? And they wrote it down or they made a story. They told the story and that's how history gets passed down. That's your task at this moment. The people who are gonna chronicle what's happening right now are the journalists and the artists. And our job is to facilitate and to uh, enable you to be able to do that. The songs that you sing, the songs that you write, the books that you write, the paintings, the, the photographs that you take, the plays that you write. Um, all of that is what we are trying to encourage and inspire you to do right here, right now. I almost feel like your task is far more difficult than my task had been when I graduated. So what I wanted to do is bring a, a situation where we could all come together, uh, new actors, new artists, uh, slightly more experienced, slightly older actors and artists, where we could kind of exchange, um, challenge each other, ask questions, and you get to interact with uh, the people who are doing it now and who have been doing it now. This week's guest, is there's like there's a there's a saying in our profession which is like a triple threat which means you can sing you can dance and you can act well this week's guest is i don't know what the number would be like multi 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 threat she can sing she can dance she can act she also presents she's uh, on television she also presents on radio she also is an author, she's also a journalist, she's done everything, the list goes on and on and on. And she's also, like you and like me, a Mountie graduate. So it's our, we some really good questions that, that you guys have been asking, that you sent in. So let's get to asking them and welcome our guest, the brilliant Amanda Holden. How are you, Amanda? Good. Yeah, I'm doing all right. I mean, it is, you're completely right. We are, without sounding pretentious, the storytellers, aren't we? So you're completely right. We'll be um, passing down this information in the future and hopefully we'll get the story right because there's lots of journalists that I beg to differ might not get it right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. If they do their <laughs> job properly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. I'm just about dance. I love I'm that you I was never great at dance. Chore all choreographers need loads of patience when they have kept me in a show. <laughs> Tell me about it. I'm always like, you know, you get there and like the, the dancing members of the company, they go, okay, this bang, 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 then they do it. And I'm like, okay, so my, my left foot is which one? That one's my left foot. Okay, fine. Yeah. And that I do to you. And then I make up stupid names. So I go, okay, so then I do the chicken bit, then I do the twirly ice skater, then I do yeah. this. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So, glad you're well, good to see you. Thank you so much for taking time to come and answer our questions and talk with us and share with us. Really, really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. So let's get to the questions. Let's get to the questions, because we've I've got some, just to kind of work out who it is we're talking to, uh, yeah. and a little bit more about where, where, your, where your background is, where you're from. And then I'm gonna hand over to some good questions that we've got from our students. So, first question is, where were you born, Amanda Holden? So, Giles, I was born in uh, St Mary's Hospital in Portsmouth, Pompey, down in Hampshire, and Brilliant. then and then I moved to a tiny weeny village called Bishop's Waltham, where and that's basically where I grew up till I was around fourteen, fifteen. Um, and where did you go to school? So there was a school. I went to Ridgemead Junior, and then I went to Swanmore Secondary School, which is now called a Technological College. Um, yeah, it's a lot. It seems a lot cleverer than when I when I was there. <laughs> and was there like was there performing there? Did you did you do plays? Did you do shows? Did you do activities? 
Yeah, so, so it was a totally, so I literally came from a little tiny village. I lived on a housing estate. My mum did not know what to do with me. I used to do performances of Greece on the front lawn with the poor little girl down the road who had to be uh, John Travolta. She was called Anna Cox. No idea. What it I used to steal my mum's hoop earrings and, <laughs> and obviously was Sandy. And, uh, <laughs> and, and my mum didn't know, she didn't know what to do with me. And then in a, lo locally, this woman then, she was called Angie Stanley. She moved into our village and we had this tiny weeny church hall and she set up Bishop's Waltham Little Theatre. And that was like, oh my God, this is it. Wow. This, I don't have to do it on my front lawn anymore. And that, and that kind of set me off all amateur dramatics, all free, obviously, because we had no money. Right. And, um, and, and that's where I kind of, I don't know what I learned. I mean, I learned to have fun. I learned to be confident and I made loads of friends and it was, it was brilliant and thank God for her. Do you know where, because this is something I'm really interested in with all our guests, like, do you know where the kind of performing, the acting, the singing skill came from in your family? Were there other actors or performers or artists in your family? So it's a, it's a tricky one. On my father's side, my biological father, who I knew nothing about, I found out, actually, this is quite recent, um, when I did that show, Who Do You Think You Are? Yeah. My grandfather, my father's dad, was as it was a mental health nurse during the war, World War II, and entertained the troops and was brilliant on the banjo. So I can't play the banjo or a guitar or anything with strings. But I think that kind of extrovert personality probably definitely came from that side, I would say. My mum was always brilliant at encouraging. She kind of was my best audience growing up. And I suppose... Right. I, really. Bottom <laughs> right, because I was going to say, was it, was, how was your mum? Did you think... Okay, this is something really cool to encourage, or is it a bit like, why are you, why are you interested in this? But you've just kind of answered that. Yeah, well, she, because she was brought up in the sixties where dreams were not encouraged at all. She had to learn, you know, Pittman's shorthand typing, yeah. and she had a proper job. She couldn't wait to leave home, so she did that by getting married. Um, you know, it was a very kind of oppressed era. So I think when she had me and my sister. She was, uh, she was really young. She was 21 when she had me, 22 when she had my sister. She was kind of quite cool mom, young. Yeah. And I think she just encouraged us to do uh, to live our dreams. I, I, and I think she probably had a lot of foresight, but also a lot of maybe bitterness because she wasn't, she wasn't a naturally a performer, but I don't think she would have been a shorthand secretary had she right. been given a choice when she was growing up, so. Right. So was it something that when you were a kid, you felt oh, this is what I want to do with my life? Or was it like, this is fun. This is, I enjoy doing this. Did no. you know? Yeah, and I don't know why, because no one, absolutely no one around me was doing it. No <laughs> one. We had, when that when the lady came and, and ran Bishop's Waltham Little Theatre, you know, my mum ran the bar, my dad made the props. My sister was always in the chorus constantly because she just liked to muck about at the back. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> And then no one, everyone enjoyed it, but no, I knew that's what I wanted to do. And I wow. can't, another person, not even my school friends who I'm still in touch with now, they all said, oh yeah, you always wanted to be an actress. Always, you just always, wow. I don't know, honestly, I don't know where it came from because I didn't really sit down. I mean, the stuff my mum used to let me watch, you know, she used to let me stay up and watch Benny Hill because I liked the dancing. Oh, yeah. I now know what the dance, <laughs> you go, oh my God, that she called me down. She said, Benny Hill's on, man. <laughs> and I used to sit there. That was like the best thing in the world. Wasn't it? Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, now you look at it and you go, oh, my God. But at the time. <laughs> it was very funny. Um, so how did you get from there to Mountview? So unbelievably, my mum and dad's dream was to always have a B&B. &B. My dad was a second-hand car dealer. My mum was a secretary. They managed to save enough money to buy a house in Bournemouth um, that had extra bedrooms that they could set up as a as a B and B. And I was devastated because all my friends were going to go to college in in and around sort of Southampton, Hampshire area. And um, my mum found this performing arts college in Bournemouth. It's part of the university now. It's, it wasn't even a university then. It was called Je the Jellico Theatre, and it. <laughs> Oh, oh, is that? 
Wait one second, one second, one second, one second. I love it when people. Oh, nice to time. I love knowing when people have you. That's the best thing about all of this. It's very tidy, they're here. Lots of books on the top. Good to you. Uh, you just did a through the keyhole in your absence. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. That hasn't happened before. That's good. Okay. Um, I cut you off. Yeah, so anyway, so um, my mum found this amazing college that did drama and I had to go and audition. It was my first ever audition for anything in front of this man called Terry Clark, who's since died, bless him. Charles Lamb was his sidekick who still works there, who's just an extraordinary man. And um, and I, my mum sat there in the audition and she said, oh, Mander, do your Marilyn Monroe impression. I mean, honestly, it was excruciating, the whole thing. I sort of said, I hate you, I don't want to know. I got it. And, um, and that moment in my life, that my mum kind of forcing me down to Bournemouth and getting me into that college was the most, when I look back, probably the biggest turning point of my entire life and got me yeah. properly trained. Then we did lighting, everything, sound, dance, everything. And we did our A-levels in English and theatre studies and everything. And then from there we were coached and went, you know, I got off the coach every kind of weekend that I could afford it when I was 18 and auditioned for various drama schools. And then luckily I got into Mountview. Why did you choose Mountview in, in the end? Was it? It was, it was, I really loved Mountview and I really loved Lambda. And for me, I think Mountview at the time was doing, it's the, they were the first school to do this big proper musical theatre course. Yeah. Um, and it seemed, I know this is terrible, but it seemed like a less scary, less pretentious, School. I hate saying that because it, the others felt quite um, too formal for me and for my yeah. personality, I think. And when I yeah. went to Mountview, I felt like I could be myself at Mountview and I was totally right. I, I, you know, you learn all kinds of things about yourself, don't you, at drama school? Yeah. I didn't, I lived with uh, two guys, two guys, one that went to Weber Douglas, one that went to uh, the drama centre. And flipping it, they were traumatized every weekend about something. And I had an amazing three years of my life. <laughs> and I'm the only one working, mostly. So I'm like, okay, that was a good move. <laughs> well, because the thing is that, like, it seems that you came from a, a background where a, a, a kind of pathway into theatre wasn't necessarily a kind of given, or you didn't have a lot of frame of references. I was exactly the same. Yeah. And uh, it struck me when I came to Mount View, exactly the same, that somehow there was, uh, yes, there were the people there who, you know, whose mum and dad took them to the Royal Shakespeare Company every week. But then there was also kind of just random people like me who didn't have any background in theatre. I think one of the really cool things, now the theatre school has changed a lot, but oh, it's still really important now that it's a massive drama school compared to when I went there, that we, as you know, we go into um, different communities, different towns, um, and really find out people, young people, who might not necessarily have a, a direct pathway to a drama training. Um, so I'm always just, the reason why I'm asking is it's, it's always really, um, I think, important to uh, encourage those young kids out there who might be thinking, well, I don't really, you know, have any frame of reference for this, but it's what I really, really want to do. And it's really good to hear that that was your experience as well, because now look at you. Thank you. And, and I still think, I mean, you're right. I went to Mountview uh, not that long ago, just before lockdown and everything else and had a good old proper look round. And it's yeah. absolutely massive. Isn't but, it amazing? I mean, I couldn't get over it. it. It was, it's extraordinary. Compared to like Crouch End. Yeah. Quite a lot of things was falling down, which I never minded at all either, because I still was in awe of it. Every time I went anywhere to do with theatre, I was just in yeah. awe. When I went to the you know, I still go, to, I still dress up when I go to the theatre. I'm the only person I know right. that does it, because it's still a thing for me. <laughs> but, right, 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 right. You're right, the atmosphere at Mountview is still um, inclusive. It felt very inclusive back in, you know, I graduated in 1992, and it, it felt very um, family. That's how it felt. That's how it felt. Yeah. Really. Came down to London from a village and felt at home at that school. What were your 
ambitions, like your hopes when you went there? What did you, did you have an idea of like, okay, I want to leave Mount View with this X, Y, Z, or were you just, were you just in it? I was, I, I definitely, I used to, I needed, I was like, I'm going to get an agent. I have to get an agent. This is everybody has to get an agent, but you know, you know, you yeah. write thousands and thousands of letters. I did all of yeah. that. I had it because I was thinking about this. I thought you might ask me that. And I just, the only plan I had was that I wanted to, to at least have had a good job by the time I was 30. I was 21 when I left and 30 felt like, you know, absolute yeah. ages. Right, away. right. I made a promise to myself. I thought I won't, I will always have theatre in my life, but I won't hang around after 30 and hope for the best. If I haven't made it by then, I am just gonna keep it there, but I'll do other things that involve it. Yeah. And I don't know what else, what, why I had this in my head. I never, I sound so arrogant now, but it wasn't, I think it was just because I was young. I never had any doubt that I would work. And that's not because I thought I was brilliant, because I didn't either. I was r riddled with insecurities and I still am, as is every actor. Um, and so I just, I don't know, I think it must have been youth. Because I said to my husband, I said, I don't know where I got that. Absolute, now I'm going to work. It's going to all be fine. I am going to work by the time I'm 30. Watch, watch me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all I'm, right. I've got less confidence now. I'm like that. Oh, I've got well, exactly. to <laughs> <laughs> Once you know what the profession is, it, yeah, but you're right. I think it, I don't think it is arrogance. I think it is you. When you're, when you're young, you don't really know what you can and can't do. So you do what you want to do, what you enjoy. Yeah. Um, you don't, but was it, was, go on. You just don't know what's on the other side. So, yeah, I suppose you don't. I, never, I used to always think as well when I went in for auditions, which I would say to any, anybody watching, is I never, I used to hear people go in before me who could sing better, who could act better, who could do, I, in my opinion, everything better. But I used to think, they haven't got this. I'm going to, and I honestly used to think I used to talk myself into them. And they would, at least they'd remember me when I left. <laughs> so. But that's brilliant. That's really, I think that's a really important thing because when you go into an audition, I often say to like young, young actors, like you only have that one moment to go in there and make an impression, so why hold back? So no holding back, you see. It's no holding back. <laughs> <laughs> what was your first job when you left Mountview? Um, I auditioned, I got a job, it was called In Suspicious Circumstances, and it was with Granada Television, and, oh, was that my first job? Yes, it was. And it was with, um, Thingy Glenister, you know, Philip Glenister. Right. Philip Glenister and, he, and his dad was directing it and Edward Woodward used to introduce it and it was a true crime drama. So he'd sit in his chair a bit like Hitchcock and say, once upon a time, there was this story and this happened and this happened. Yeah. Go back in time. And it was true. All of it was true. And I played a character called Alice Meadows. And my husband uh, had been having an affair and I think he got done and got hung and it's very sad. Oh. Well, Did you? Manchester was so exciting. So was TV and like film and stuff part of your dream to begin with or was it just music? Or like, did you have any idea of that, of all of it? I didn't, we didn't do kind of television technique or anything at Mount View at that time. That, that was not something that was on the course. And so, I just went in and suddenly there's a camera here because it was a multi-camera thing because it was quick. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and and how, I also pretend it wasn't there in the first, it was all really bizarre. How did you then sort of pick it up and, and get more comfortable? Because you've done like all of the TV. I, um, well, the John, I think John Glenister, which is Philip's dad, I think I've got his name right, was fantastic. And I was playing quite a very sweet sort of naive girl and back then that's what I was caster <laughs> um, anyway, um, and they were just brilliant I just remember Philip being absolutely fantastic just saying just look at me and when he was off camera he would say you know this is a close-up so this is going to be on you I'm still going to be here so you look at me don't look at the camera and I mm. had like a crash course in yeah. you know the line and all of the stuff and I you pick it up pretty quick and really? constantly 
Beauty, I that became my one of my favorite things to remember what I'd done and how much I had in my yeah. car. I loved all of that and props. I love props. I love um, anything complicated. So I learned very, very fast. How do you deal with um, disappointment? Like, you know, one of the difficult things when you graduate is kind of auditioning for things, not getting things. And it can be quite tricky for graduates to sort of work that out. Do you have a particular way of dealing with that disappointment? I don't know if you ever um, fully find a way through anything like that, because life is disappointing and everything you kind of want doesn't always happen. I am a massive fatalist at that. And this that has only come from being let down on jobs. I remember once I was so desperate to find out if I had this job because it was just the two of us that I rang a psychic um, who told me I wasn't going to get the job and I didn't believe her. So I was like, what? That's how nuts I was when I first left drama school. And then I think you gradually just think, I have to let it go. That's not my time because every single job I've got has led to something else or to me meeting someone who's still a friend or to falling in love with somebody. And every story attached to the part I've played has gone somewhere. And I so believe that it was all kind of mapped out that you kind of have to learn to sit back. I've always, always done my best and I've always kind of gone to the nail with trying to persuade people or not letting things drop. I'm terrible for things like that, but then you just have to accept it's a no. It's hard, but you have to. But, I mean, there's no easy way and it doesn't get any easier. It just doesn't. What is your cat called? Was that the cat that just walked across the back of the room? Yes, did she just go past? Yeah, it looked amazing. Let's see, let's see the cat, because this is important. Look at this. Oh, and the dog. Oh yeah, there's a doggy down there. Oh my gosh, we just Aww. got to... Look, look. Who's this? This is Muffy. Hi, Muffin. Muffy. Oh. <laughs> not interested, she's not interested at all. Like, seriously, darling, I was on my way. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's a bit fraught. We've ju we've just got two rabbits, and both of them are can't uh, make things up. Yeah, they're in the garden in a run. Um, so, so speaking of animals, yes. segue <laughs> segueing. Do you like I could, I could I could present? I'm segueing. Shrek <laughs> and Thoroughly Modern Millie are two uh, shows that we know you for. That you've been massively successful in. Um, what can you tell us? Like the most enjoyable thing about those two experiences and also the most challenging thing about those two experiences so for, for thoroughly modern millie um they came and spoke to me about being in it and then i had to go to new york and that i mean i can't even swallow because i i because for me going to broadway i had to audition on broadway wow i had to go in to this room with Janine Tesori and the writers of the show and like everyone was proper. And I've, I, I will always continue, at least a cliche, to not feel, you know, like, oh God, you know, that this is the day, this is the day they're gonna see I'm crap. Yeah, um, yeah. And I went in and I did everything and then I had to stay the night and then I had to go back in and, and there was massive discussions. It was not a given. And um, for me, that was one of the most terrifying auditions ever. When, when I got it, and then we all became very friends, friendly and good friends, um, it was, uh, Janine said, she, it was my shoes that clinched it. I, Your shoes? <laughs> I walked in with a massive pair of heels on and a frock, because she was like, Brilliant. I saw your heels. I was like, what do you mean? I spent hours learning that tap dance. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and they were really a camp, really brilliant camp, funny women. And I had an amazing experience, but the dancing was one of the biggest things. Cause I, I will definitely, I was a gymnast most of my life, but I was not a dancer. And Rob Ashford, who was then just a humble choreographer. Wow. Would sit, I know I would come in an hour earlier than everyone else because I didn't want to look like a plonker. Yeah amazing dancers and so he would come in an hour early I would come in an hour early so I'd look much quicker than I was when I was doing it with all these amazing 
girls and boys. And it just, yeah, I put a lot of, I mean, I loved the show, but it was the dancing for me. That was the hardest thing. It was, a, and I had, I remember I took tennis lessons up as well. But, and I said, I, and I played tennis whilst sh constantly talking to my tennis coach. Cause I said, I need to be able to keep moving because I'm doing this music. Yeah. And it's really nice. <laughs> <laughs> my tennis was rubbish as I knew I mustn't swear um, but yeah, I could definitely talk and sing and move at the same time <laughs> <laughs> play tennis and learn your lines and sing <laughs> yeah and what about Shrek Shrek was um an incredible uh and, and again an incredible um a, a, a terribly humiliating audition because I went in and when I came out, all the secretaries were in the room. They'd all heard me, and I've got, I was just dying at that point because you just because I was in an office block. It was it wasn't in a, like a hall or anything. Mm. So I was really really embarrassed, waiting ages again to hear. Got the part, um, and the whole thing without putting a somber thing on it was that my husband and I had had um, a stillbirth not that long before. And I decided to continue with the show, carrying quite a lot of grief and doing the most amazing, happy musical. And then finding out I was pregnant again, right in the middle of it, which was amazing news. But Princess Fiona had massive breasts by the time she left that role. <laughs> and she had an ogre in her tummy. We're still not clear on who the father was. <laughs> I mean, you look like a child, you make your own mind up. <laughs> Doing Shrek for me was the best thing about it, I think, apart from everyone in it again, because you just, it's just, an, you know, I love, that's the thing, I love camaraderie and it gets you through everything, being in the West End and being with a group of amazing people, was the fact that I had a, an older daughter who's, it was her movie franchise, so, mm. Fiona was, I uh, mean, like a dream come true. She'd be wow. all the time. She's, she knows, wow. the, she knows Drury Lane, Lane, like the back of her hand, and my husband wow. does, everywhere. To places they shouldn't have gone. It was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's a bit of a cliche, but do you have like, do you prefer theatre or being on telly or or or, do, or not? Did not uh, matter. I, I suppose when you're filming, like my favourite thing on telly to film, it would be comedy, definitely, because again, every comedy, at most of the comedies I've filmed, we did it in front of an audience. Because I prefer live people, I prefer people. When we do Britain's Got Talent, it's just incredible to have people there. So I suppose but I prefer theatre because I, I like an immediate and honest reaction. No canned laughter, no hoping you've done it well and someone will respond. That Having that live audience and that buzz and that terror, I don't think will ever leave me. But I can't nowadays. I can't do it so often because it's knackering and it, and I'm old, and it takes a lot of time up. And I'm always doing other stuff. But yeah, I will. I would kill to get back into the West End when lockdown's over. I know mean, well, loads of us would bless everybody. Yeah. That, um, yeah. Have to stay at home at the moment. Um, can you tell us an example? Like you've done so many different things. Um, and there's so many things that you, you've tried and you've been successful at. Can you tell us like an example of a time in your career where listening to your instincts really paid off, where you thought, actually, I don't want to do that. And it sort of paid off. Or I really, really think I should take that route. And it paid off. Because I'm always telling young actors, again, to sort of listen to that voice within. Yeah. within because often you can't see it at the time, but later on you go, oh, that's why I did that or not did that. Can you think of any moments where that's happened? It's, I think it's a hard one. I think what I've learned to say more of rather than following, because it's, it's a difficult thing. My career has gone in such a bizarre direction. After I talked to you about that job, I then went into sketch comedy and then drama. Yeah, then right. Comedy. And then when I was doing comedy, no drama would have me. I mean, it's just, and then I did, it's just so weird how, how it sort of goes. It all comes back round. I think I learned to, the most important lesson I think I've taught myself is 
is not to to worry about whether people like me or not anymore. I think when I first left drama school, I was, I am still a little, to some extent, a people pleaser and you cannot make everyone like you. I respect everyone. So every time I get a job, I treat, everyone's treated the same by me. I know, and I also learn everybody's names, which is a, an actress called Caroline Quentin said, just, just always remember everyone's names. I yeah. always remember everyone's names. I hate people that, treat people yeah I hate actors that basically think they're really really important because we're just yeah. not um but I think learning to say no and learning not to worry if people didn't like me has been the toughest lesson I've learned I've probably said yes to too many things I probably haven't listened to my inner voice as much as I'd have liked if I'm being honest with you um and therefore my career has has varied because of that. But when I look back, I can't think of many things I would have changed. So I'd like to think that that means I made the right decisions. But trying my best not to be a people pleaser is an ongoing process. Mm. And still something I would totally recommend to everybody out there. You can't, you can't please everyone. You can't make everyone like you. Mm. Fuck them. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. <laughs> <laughs> She's heard worse, but we like to pretend that we don't swear. <laughs> Fuck them. So, can you name three people without whom um, the performer, the artist, Amanda Holden, wouldn't be here? And can you say why, how they um, influence you? Okay, so I would definitely say... Angie Stanley, who set up Bishop's Waltham Little Theatre. Yeah. She put me there. I would say Terry Clark, who is in heaven and was the guy in Bournemouth who taught me so much uh, over two years. And then I'm, I am probably going to say Rob Ashford because he gave me the confidence to just believe that I could do it, do this massive, massive musical with no real proper, I mean, I had a load of telly experience and stuff behind me, but I, you know, I was not any kind of a um, West End Dolly, West End Wendy at that stage. And I learned so much from him. So yes, them. Great, brilliant. How do you, um balance again something that a lot of students ask is or they comment on is like the pressures that students young people any young person now like with social media and the pressures that, you, that young people are under to be a certain thing is huge and it strikes me that you've been through like some really huge things in your career some of the things you've just spoken about so the question is how do you keep sort of um balanced and authentic to yourself in, in this kind of world where like if you take like the, the um uh the reality tv stuff where it's live and there's, there's there's people's whole dreams and lives at stake with it and then everyone has an opinion online and blah, 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 and the media and how do you stay balanced in all of that i'm so lucky that when i started out none of it was invented because i might not have got through it <laughs> I've, I've, I've experienced it all. I think 2009 is when I joined Twitter and it all started. So I feel like I was pretty much hardened to a lot of things at that point. Um, everything I've gone through since then has been massively public because of journalists and just because of an interest. Um, and it's difficult. I'm very lucky. I've got a very strong relationship. So I've got a very strong husband who is very sensible, not like me in any way, who sort of cuts through all the bullshit and keeps me sane. And I've got, a, I feel like I've got a very normal un life on the side. I would say the best thing you can do for yourself is to have proper kind of if you can find it, love in your life or proper kind of values or even a normal job. I mean, I had a normal job through, through all the times when I wasn't working. You know, I've done every job under the sun and 
I think being keeping grounded and keeping with a, a proper sense of reality where people are properly suffering like you know if you look now you look at the NHS and but then you look at you know other people who are moaning about the fact that someone you know has told them off because they're not dying their hair or something you just think well that's a load of crap and the NHS is what's real or this suffering is real your everyone's suffering is real to them but I would just say you, you have to try and keep some kind of sense of grounding and reality and how much does it actually matter in the in the bigger sense of the world it just hardly anything really matters as long as you're healthy and happy and relatively stable because I say relatively because I don't consider myself like that <laughs> I would say crack open a bottle of rosé <laughs> Honestly, you just you just have to constantly just not care. You have to try not to care too much about anything that's written about you, any comments. Never scroll down. The next book I write about yeah. myself, I will call it, just for God's sake, don't scroll down. Yeah. It, none of them matter a jot. Like if, if I die tomorrow, no one will remember any of the rubbish stuff. They'll just remember I was a mummy and hopefully I was a good wife. And I like to trampoline naked in my back garden. That's why everyone learned about me during lockdown. You know, it's, it's all, it's all. <laughs> and she likes it. <laughs> brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. So I want to hand over a little bit to our students in a minute, but I just wanted to ask one final question, which is you've, um, you help, you do a lot of, of, um, work for different charities and different organizations and different people and you help students a lot why is it important to you to help um students young actors because i think if ever there was a time to realize your dreams it's now i think everything is in the balance i mean now more than ever but i used to i would I, i've always said this being an actor is as tough as going to get a job at a bank so you might as well pursue your dreams. I was so fortunate that I had a mum and a dad who were uh, very encouraging. They were all the, always there for me. Whatever differences we had, they definitely believed in me. They made me believe in myself. And I think if I can show a student or anything, I am honestly just a nobody girl from a tiny village that had no money at all. I worked all the way through working at Mount View. I had a job on a Saturday and a Sunday. I was always skin. And I think if I can do it, you can 100% do it. And if I can give them any kind of confidence or belief in themselves, just, just even one, that would be just amazing for me. That would be amazing. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, this question, okay, some questions coming up if my computer holds up. This is from uh, Amelia. Okay, having performed in shows and trained in theatre, how did you come to centre now in radio and TV? And what avenues can you suggest to go down if you want to branch out from musical theatre? What, what aids versatility in your experience? There's quite a lot actually, but I hope that makes sense. Um, all, well, all of them are kind of, to be honest, happy accidents, I suppose. I, I mean, I, the, the radio thing surprised me as, as much as anything. I didn't expect to be doing radio. I also expected to be able to just not put any makeup on and put my pyjamas on, which is not what happens in radio anymore. Damn. I know. I yeah, but like, you, you, you knew you could talk, though. You said when you went in that audition, you knew that you yeah. could talk. Wonderful having an outlet every day, let me tell you. <laughs> my husband's off the hook. It's brilliant. The house is quiet when I get back. Um, <laughs> I think just keeping an open mind. I always remember, and, and she won't mind me saying it, but one of my dearest friends, Jane, who turned 50 yesterday, who now lives in America. Happy birthday, Jane. Um, she had a real thing where she didn't want to do, she's like, I'm not gonna work in soaps when I leave drama school. I'm not gonna do this when I leave drama school. I'm just not gonna be involved. In it. And, and, and it wasn't just her, it was just loads of people, quite sort of snotty about things. And I would be like, well, I'm just happy, I just wanna work. I just don't want to continue having to sell shoes at the weekend, which is what I was doing. Um, I want to be able to, to work and I'll do anything. And I think having that mentality, not closing down anything 
if you going to do work experience, I mean, for free, you'll have to do it for free. Making coffee, just being annoying, knocking on doors is another thing that my dad told me to do, which I in, uh, would find excruciating, embarrassing, but I did. I, I yeah. went everywhere I could, I knocked on doors. Everyone needs help, everyone needs PA, everyone. I get asked for Britain's Got Talent all the time. And I, I if any of you want to come and make a cup of coffee for me on Britain's Got Talent for the day, come down. Because then it's up to you to go and annoy someone and see if you can get your foot in the door. Yeah. Easy open the door. And, and that's how I try and help people now, as I have loads of different girls, boys coming in everywhere. Before, obviously, we had to stay two metres apart. Yeah. When, they, when those um, centimetres are banned, then I will do it again. Yeah, so I remember when... Mind open. Say again, sorry? Mind open. Stay yeah. In. That's what I was Yeah. Saying. I remember that the same thing at Mount View when I was there of people saying, oh, I, I would never want to do panto or I'd never want to do this. And I was like, I want to do all of that. that yeah. That, yeah. There's loads of pantos. They're brilliant. Yeah. I never yeah. played them. You can't beat that yeah. one. I mean, panto is <laughs> a brilliant way to learn quick. Yes, of course. Of oh, course. You watch so many amazing people on stage in a pantomime who've learned their craft over 30, 20, 30 years. I yeah, hate totally. it. I hate it. Yeah. Likewise. Um, Jake. Jake asks, um, you've obviously had a lot of success in both theatre and television. When filming reality television or presenting talk shows, do you feel you're still constantly using the skills and performance techniques that you learned on stage? Yes, because even though I'm really open and very much myself most of the time, it is a fake circumstance, isn't it? When you're sitting on a panel. Yeah and judging you you are I am very aware of myself of what I should say next sometimes I pretend I'm not and, and I'm outrageous when then I'm like oh I had no idea <laughs> how to say that um, who pops out I had no idea that was going to happen <laughs> you know, you, um, there are circumstances where you know you know what you're doing and the situation is always ongoing so you are always aware i think i've never done a show like if i was in the jungle or something like that or in big brother which i would i just wouldn't i couldn't do because i think i'd be very at home in something a situation like that and i'd let my guard down completely and let myself down and end my career after they finish it <laughs> <laughs> because you forget you can't see the cameras and you forget about them so, he's on guard is what i say <laughs> <laughs> this is from fiona the uh, another fiona says, what are you watching or reading in lockdown? Okay. We don't really have quite personal questions. That's quite a personal question, but okay. you know. In that sense. You know what I'm absolutely loving? Me and Chris watched it back to back last night and I'm really glad because it's a, it's a drama-y thing. It's about drama students. It's called the Kaminsky Method and it's got Michael Douglas in it. And he plays a kind of, well, we have a teacher called Sam Cogan at Mount View. And he feels like a very Sam Cogan teacher. He's sort of very Stanislavski based. Yeah. Get the nitty gritty of the actual person involved. But on the other side, it's all about him and how fallible he is and how terrible he is in his own life and how he doesn't really. It's very, very funny and moving. So if you're not watching anything, watch that. And I don't ever read unless I'm on holiday anymore because I've got two kids and a husband that constantly pour at me. I don't get any time to read. So. I think the last thing I read was The Capital. I think it was The Capital. It was about a murder in um, okay. Peep Street or somewhere in Chiswick or somewhere like hey. that. <laughs> <laughs> I it as well, but that went out the window when I had kids and got married. <laughs> well, it happens. Um, Olivia, Olivia Sherry asks, um, what would your advice be to drama school graduates auditioning straight out of school? What would your advice be? We kind of slightly touched on that, but. Yeah, I think it's trying to, well, I used to always sit too close to where the person was all, I, mean, I used to feel sick, especially when you had to go and audition at Spotlight, or you're in that room. Yeah. Was in that room. So I used to yeah. spend a lot of time in the toilet, so I didn't uh, kind of work out which one was up for my part. Yeah. Well, immediately, uh, you know, second best. Um, so I would say spend as much time as you can out of the room. Um, totally nail it before you go in as an ob that's obvious but use your skills that no one else has which is 
being you, which is what I said earlier. Your personality, your energy, don't underestimate it. Don't underestimate what it can bring to an audition. Your personality is so much, especially for long running programs where they have to get a cast a group of people that are all gonna get on well. And I know, I mean, I know that I've walked into auditions before and because I, I made friends, Gareth Neem, who ran, owned Carnival Films, who then did Downton Abbey, who's done everything. I went up for a role in Happy Birthday Shakespeare. And he said, when you walked into the room, we'd already cast it. There was no way you were gonna get that part. And I got that part. He said, you walked out and you got the part. I don't know how you did that. Neither do I know, but it was a lot to do with that. And I'm still friends with that man. <laughs> so <laughs> you don't underestimate your own personality and your own energy is what I'd say. Don't be Amazing. a man. Condition. Amazing. Speaking of long running shows, so you were on EastEnders. Really for two seconds. Yes. That was but, like one of my first jobs. Yeah. But it's like. Uh, that... Stay in it. <laughs> yeah, but still, you have to still walk in with those people who've been in it forever. Oh Massive my God. What was that like? I was very cheeky. I, 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 I mean, gosh, I was so desperate to stay in that I had to take over a stall for half an hour. You could look after the stall for half an hour. <laughs> and, um, and I was opposite Adam Woodyak's Ian Beale. So I was, you know, cheeky with cucumbers and melons and anything I could get my hands on to try and make myself... <laughs> I even shoved notes under the producer doors saying, you need me for longer than two minutes. You know, I did everything. It didn't get me the part. But Adam Woodjack, I made friends with people like Patsy Palmer, I stayed friends with. Oh. All these actors that were so sweet took pity on me, gave me a lift home so I didn't have to get the chew. Um, <laughs> again, I relied on my personality and my cheek. Um, they never forgot me, but I never stayed in it. <laughs> but then it but wasn't me. did it. But you yeah. did it. <laughs> Sam, Sam asked a question. Okay, Sam says, we third years at Mountain View have all handed in our final submissions, marking an end to our education and the start of the journey into the industry. We're all filled with excitement and nerves. If you could go back in time to the day you finished Mount View, what is the one piece of advice you'd give yourself? Don't, don't make any plans. <laughs> Because I, I remember thinking, I gave myself till 30, as I said, and I had worked by then enough for me to continue going. But I remember when I got, I can't even remember what role it was, but I worked it out that it was 20 years later. And I thought if I'd have said to myself in July 92, in 20 years, you're going to really feel like you've come home and you, you've done it. I would have gone, oh, I'm not bloody waiting 20 years. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing 20 years. I'm going to have to do something else. Because 20, it goes like that. So I would say, yeah. don't make any plans. Live in the moment. Don't starve. Don't be frightened of working. Don't think you're going to neglect your craft if you're not feeding yourself properly or doing a really mundane, boring job. You need to earn money. And so, and I did that all the way along and met normal, lovely, gorgeous people who came to see me in everything when I eventually worked. So just, yeah, keep the excitement as well. Keep it. Don't ever let the excitement and nerves go away. Cause they never do, do they Giles? They never go. No, it's no, no, no. It's thank always you. terrifying. Listen, thank you so much for taking the time yeah. to speak to us. Yeah, you were done, this is an hour. I'm gonna go and slap some vegetarian burgers on the barbie. And get on the trampoline. <laughs> no, I've done that. <laughs> I apologise for my neighbours. It's not even a joke. <laughs> Listen, thank you. In lockdown that definitely didn't move before lockdown. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just give you that. <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time to come and visit us and answer some of our questions and share some of your experience um and your advice we really really appreciate it. our students really really appreciate it and i'm sure that lots of people out there watching um appreciate it also so thank you so much for taking the time i know you're busy i know you've got things i know you've got family so we really appreciate it so thank you thank you for allowing me to come and do it because it was brilliant
And anyone that needs any help or come, wants to come and make coffee for me, just get in touch with the school because I will try and help when this is all over. I mean that. Brilliant. That's it. That's it. Well, that's all we have time for this week. Thank you very much to our fantastic guest, Amanda Holden. And um, if you have enjoyed what you've seen, please uh, donate to some of our um, bursaries to help out some of our students um, as they make their way into this profession, which, as we know, is a tiny bit of our society, but it is an important bit of our society. Where would we be without stories, without music, without entertainment? So thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you to our guest, Amanda Holden, and we will see you again next week. Take care of each other. Stay well. <laughs>